Welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruben Quintero, and I am the Hispanic Association leader. And first of all, I want to say to all of you that are on the back to come to the front. Pick up your belongings. Don't forget, you know, we are full in the lost and found. Uh, so pick up your belongings, come to the front, and we're going to start right now uh, this uh, session. Uh, one of the things that I love most of this season in our movement, in the Vineyard Movement, is that we uh, get to work a lot uh, in teams. So this is a teamwork uh, for the ordination process, and, and I am uh, honored to be part of uh, this team. I'm a member of this team, and I just want to read a little bit about what is this team about. This is a team serving with uh, Caleb Maskell, which, uh, who I'm going to present later, uh, to oversee the development of an, an ordination process for Vineyard USA with a view and a voice into every aspect of what is going on. We are helping to think through ways that this process can, be, can best serve Vineyard USA, contributing to our stability, clarity, longevity, uh, fidelity, and inclusivity as a movement. And the team uh, is, I love the team. This is, this is a very diverse team. Uh, and I want to mention the names uh, of uh, everyone in this team. First, uh, Amanda Clark. She's the lead pastor at Branches uh, Vineyard in Warsaw, Indiana. Uh, we're going to uh, listen from her later. Uh, Ted Kim, who is the senior pastor uh, in Evanston Vineyard in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Diane Lehman. Uh, who is the founding pastor, in, and many of you know her, uh, in uh, the Vineyard Church of Central Illinois in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. Also, uh, Cody Sondral, who is the senior pastor at the Canyon View uh, Vineyard Church in Grand Junction, Colorado. And Donald White, uh, who is the senior pastor at the Vineyard Church of Ann Arbor in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan. So I love this team because we, we have our, our own view and our own uh, perspective. And we can talk with Caleb about what we really believe uh, this ordination process uh, is and could be for the uh, benefit of all our movement and every local pastor. So um, I want to introduce now uh, who are you going to... Who are you going to hear from today? Uh, first, you're going to hear, and most of the talk will be from Caleb Maskell, who is leading this ordination process. Uh, Caleb is the Associate National Director for Theology and Education for Vineyard USA. Also, you will hear from uh, Rob Morgan, who is uh, our Managing Director for Vineyard USA. And you're going to hear from two of our uh, team members, uh, Ted Kim and Amanda Clark. So first, I want to welcome uh, Caleb Maskell. Thanks. Thanks, Ruben. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. When you're an associate national director, they give you two waters. <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for uh, being here. I know we've asked all pastors to attend this session and there's lots going on. You got lots of choices. So I really do appreciate the fact uh, that you're here. Uh, as everything Ruben said is true, we're going to hear from a number of different folks. We're going to talk about things like what ordination is not, what it is, the relationship between ordination and the theology of the Christian church, and then a lot of nuts and bolts. Where are we going? How are we getting there? So we have a lot uh, we're going to cover in the next 90 minutes. But before we start, I really just want to say this. I think the vineyard is in an incredibly exciting moment. And I mean, what we saw this morning was, I think, beautiful and new. It felt like we've entered in to a way of being together that has just more dimensions of the kingdom, whether it has to do with ethnicity and the different communities there, or the ways that women are being empowered in leadership, or the fact that we're remembering some of our fundamentals in ways that uh, feels like a fresh move of the Spirit. So I'm very, very uh, pleased about that. That's an exciting moment. 
And I think part of what makes this moment sort of exciting at, at the level of like what, what's going on underneath it all, you could say it negatively. I would say it like this. We're starting to realize we're not an accident of history. <laughs> we're starting to realize that the vineyard didn't just appear in a moment and uh, happen to coalesce around churches in the 70s and 80s and now we all have to pastor them until they fade into the sunset, <laughs> Right? I think instead what it is that we're seeing is a moment where we realize that we have a calling. The vineyard in the U.S. has a calling. The vineyard around the world has a calling. We're talking to U.S. pastors today. The vineyard in the U.S. has a calling that we've been given by God for the sake of the church and the sake of the world. And it's our job to steward that calling. This is the moment that we're in, a moment of stewardship. Um, most of you guys are pastors, right? Many of you will have probably been in rooms in your cities or your towns with other pastors, right? Uh, pastors meetings, community meetings, that kind of thing, leaders together, where you'd be recognized not just as a pastor, but as a vineyard pastor, right? Have you had that moment where you're in a room where one of your uh, fellow pastors from your city grabs you and says, hey, hey, uh, I had this really strange dream and you're from the vineyard. Do you think you could help me to know what's going on in the night in my dreams? Is God speaking to me? Yeah, have you had that moment? Or the moment where uh, somebody that you meet says, you know, I, I have a cancer diagnosis and you say, I'd love to pray for you. And they say, thank you so much. And you put your hand on their shoulder and they kind of jump like, now? And you say, yeah, yeah, in the vineyard, we pray for people right now. We pray right in the moment, if that's okay with you. And of course, I would never touch you without your permission. <laughs> um, these are the things that we carry. We carry an understanding that the kingdom of God is both in the world and not of the world, which means that we don't do culture wars. We don't do the politics of left or right. Instead, what we do is we center ourselves on the kingdom. We love the poor. Right? We recognize that everyone has need before God and that we are meant to be, perhaps above all, midwives of the work of the Holy Spirit. People in the vineyard, above all, are midwives of the Holy Spirit. That means that we're constantly looking to see where is the Spirit at work and coming alongside it saying, Lord, I want to participate with you, just like Jesus says in John 5. I want to participate in what the Father is doing, right? The Father is always at work. We show up empowered, equipped, confident, self-aware, kind, generous, humble, and say, Lord, let us participate with you in the ways that your kingdom's at work. We know these moments. This is at the center, I think, of what it is to be people who are vineyard people. So the moment's exciting for me because we're starting to recognize that that thing that we have, all those things I just described that you know and recognize as vineyard, those things are a gift that God has given to us and through us for the sake of the church and the world. It's a beautiful thing. And the interesting thing about a gift, when God gives it to you, is not just that you get to receive it, but it makes a claim on you, right? Do you guys know that moment? You know what I'm talking about. Everyone in ministry knows what I'm talking about, right? You enter into ministry receiving this beautiful gift of leadership and realize over time that when God gave you that gift and you said yes, God also took your entire life right? Right? It's, it's funny and it's also true. God takes our lives because we say, Lord, take our lives. We even sing it in songs, but he takes us seriously. He does take them. When we receive a gift, that gift makes a claim on us. When we receive a call, that call makes a claim on us. And in our context, with respect to ordination, what that means is we have to steward the gift we've been given. If God has given us a thing, if we have received something from those who came before us, if we're now inhabiting that thing we've been given and we're starting to recognize, man, we have kids, we have grandkids, we wanna pass this thing on to them, there's a work of stewardship that needs to be done. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about what we're doing as vineyard pastors in this moment, we are recognizing that the call of God has a claim on us and it's incumbent on us to steward the thing. I think that's the spirit in which uh, Phil Strout and his executive team uh, were operating when they commissioned ordination in 
2019, I suppose it was, at the end of the reorg process. They said, in order for us to land this plane, we need to develop a framework for ordination where national office and local churches are working together to name what should a vineyard pastor be, know, and do, and then help to identify and resource people who are in that place, right? I also think it's the spirit in which John Wimber, our sort of founding father, uh, was operating in the years before he he died. I've recently been reading an article. You can find it on the uh, ordination website. I'll refer to that a number of times during uh, our time together. It's just vineyardusa.org slash ordination. Wimber wrote an article in 1993 called The Vineyard Movement, Steering a Course Between Chaos we don't want that, (laughs) and traditional denominationalism. We don't want that either, right? And in that article, which I would really encourage you to read, even just as a historical document, I find it very fascinating and instructing. He kind of opens the article by just saying straight up, for better or worse, Vineyard is a denomination. Interesting, right? Has anyone ever heard the question bandied around, is the Vineyard a denomination, or heard somebody argue maybe late night at a party, Vineyard's not a denomination, it's an association, or it's a movement, or da-da-da-da-da-da-da. All fine, all conversations worth having, but it's interesting to note that in 1993, 30 years ago, John Wimber himself said, for better or worse, the Vineyard is a denomination. The question I think he's putting in front of us in that letter is, are we going to do it for better <laughs> or are we going to do it worse, right? Are we going to do it well or are we going to do it badly? Because the reality of our moment is there's work to be done, right? In Wimber's article, he says, the vineyard needs to mature structurally in a manner consistent with our calling, right? His quote is, we need structured relationship among churches with a shared sense of calling, right? A lot of what we're going to be talking about today is the way that ordination is about clarifying and articulating our shared sense of calling. In the article that he wrote, Wimber says there's benefits to this. He lists a few. I would encourage you to check it out. Um, Pastoral oversight and accountability that cares for leaders and protects God's people from abuse, either theological, ecclesiological, or moral. We want this, right? We want this. We know that we need this. Training, he says, so there'll be no more pastors left unpastored. How many of us know that pastors need to be pastored, right? How many of us know that pastors sometimes don't want to be pastored, and sometimes we need some rails to run on so we can make sure that we actually get the care that we need? I don't know what it's like. I often cancel my doctor's appointments several times before I actually show up because I don't want to go, right? When you're dealing with hard things or dealing with things you don't know how to manage, especially if you're used to being a leader, it's very, very tempting to say, ah, I don't, I don't need something right now. I'm going to just skip that area meeting or whatever, right? I'm not going to take that phone call. We need structures so that pastors will be able to stay pastored even in hard times, right? Uh, Wimber talks about mobilization through common theology, vision, values, and strategy for things like missions and church planting. He talks about organizing for growth, and he talks about theological maturation. This is an interesting point. He says, the long-range survival of the vineyard, the vineyard's remaining true to the Christian faith, depends on it becoming theologically mature. So there's lots more to say about Wimber's views, and honestly, some of us might consider Wimber's stuff kind of ancient history at this point. It was 30 years ago, and I think I've been in the vineyard longer than Wimber was in the vineyard at this point. But Wimber is someone who carried in his in his person and in the teams that he built, some of the very fundamental stuff that makes us us, like the stem cells that express the body that is the vineyard, right? Wimber carried that, so we do well to listen to him. Um, Like I said, you can find a link to that article, download it for free, or it's in a little book that Derek Morphew put together called John Wimber's Pastoral Letters, which I believe Cheryl has in the bookstore. So we're hearing it from a spirit of stewardship from Phil Strout and his team, We're hearing it from Wimber. You're hearing it from me. Has anybody in this room uh, seen the guidepost report? Show me some hands if you've seen it. Yeah? Okay. So some of you guys know what I'm talking about. The guidepost solutions report is well worth a read if you're a vineyard pastor or leader. 
Guidepost Solutions is an independent third-party organization that does assessments of organizations, usually Christian organizations, either denominations or churches or parachurch organizations. So they did a big report on the Southern Baptist Convention. They did one on Christianity Today. We hired them to independently research us. <laughs> Again, remember the going to the doctor analogy. It'll come up more than once. And, and, and we hired them to recommend policies and reforms that would be beneficial to our continued health and growth as a movement. And in their report, Guidepost recommended Vineyard USA and local vineyard churches should work together to establish a process for the joint ordination and credentialing of pastors within the, within the vineyard movement in the United States. So at this point, I'd like to welcome up Rob Morgan, the Managing Director of Vineyard USA. Yeah, give him a hand. So we can talk a little bit about the relationship between the Guidepost Solutions Report and the work we're doing in ordination. We'll talk a bit about what ordination is for us and also some of what it isn't. So let me take my seat. Rob, talk to us about the Guidepost Report. What is it? Uh, what have we learned from it? Well, you did a great job of describing what it was and what it is, um, and I saw a, a, a fraction of the room has seen the report. I would strongly encourage you to log on to our website to find the report. We actually have a landing page which is called Guidepost Solutions because we had them do a number of assessments on us and have been helping us navigate some of the challenges of this moment and kind of bringing the reorg from the clouds to the ground. Um, the assessment was simply that. It was an opportunity for us to engage a third party uh, organization to look at us from the outside, because the reorg in many ways and the work of the executive team and Phil's even prophetic utterances or considerations a number of years ago were from the inside and imagining what it could look like and assessing based on their own experiences as leaders in the movement, where were our shortcomings, where were the stresses on our system that we were unable to manage effectively in certain areas. So we invited Guidepost to do that work from the outside and to align with what, with what they saw with what our experience was. And specifically, we asked them to look at areas related to disassociations, uh, pastoral failings, misconduct, allegations of abuse, and how when that stress hits our system, how does our system respond? So in many ways, it's akin to a stress test that you might know from a different sort of an industry. In manufacturing or in uh, uh, healthcare, there's different stress tests that people experience or that we put our systems through to see where is the system strong and where is the system weak. And so that's what Guidepost looked at. Where is our system weak in relationship to some of the things that are the most stressful for local churches and certainly translocal leadership and our national leadership? And as you can imagine, they found some weaknesses. And those weaknesses were things like lack of training, lack of clear policies and procedures related to these issues, and in many ways it was also lack of manpower is we just have had a highly volunteer managed and led system over time that sometimes it's hard to put the kind of the the work into addressing some of these things. So they gave us what was akin to a stress test. Now if you have worked in the industries, I'm not a a mechanic, I'm not a repairman, so I don't know all the intricacies of a stress test, but if you push stress through your system and something breaks, you now have great information. If you run the same test again and the same part breaks again, you now have really helpful information. Either that part is faulty or the system itself has some problems that it needs to address and we figure that out. In many ways, that's what the Guidepost report is, a stress test revealing areas and let me just offer this. If you read the report, or if you will read the report, it's not a shocking expose. <laughs> you shouldn't be surprised that organizations have challenges addressing stress in their system. It was helpful for us to see and helpful for someone else to share with us their findings about our beloved movement. Yeah, that's good. So the report makes a number of recommendations. Talk to us about what we're going to see happening in relationship uh, to the guidepost report as we move forward. Sure, well, I would offer this initially, again, if you've read it or if you're going to read it, once you read it, just pause and take a deep breath. <laughs> Similar to Caleb's suggestion about this being sort of a doctor's visit, sometimes they share with you important news, and, and it really is important for us to take a moment and, and read it and reflect upon it and breathe deeply and know that, firstly, Jesus loves his church, and he loves this church. And for millennium, he has invited imperfect people to give leadership to imperfect communities in which these things rise to the surface. And then he's asked us to care for one another. Mm. 
and to love his church, even in its fallenness, even in its brokenness. So we just take a moment, we pause, we take a deep breath, we reflect, and we say, thank you, Jesus, for the church. Thank you for this church. Mm -hmm. Thank you for my church. Thank you for this family you've put me in. And then, as is often the case, we start doing hard work. We start asking difficult questions, and we begin to address the recommendations. Caleb alluded to one recommendation, the ordination. There are 19 recommendations. 19. And they, they generally fall into some larger buckets around relational integration and professional conduct and governance and policy. So our job over the next number of years, and this is a year's process, is to look at them, prioritize them, assess what must be done immediately, assess what must be strategized, and really seek the wisdom of our movement for the ways that our churches must address some of these things. And so the first thing that will happen in the coming weeks is that actually at a 60-day mark, which the report came out in late July, so in late August, you will receive an update. I'm sorry. Late June. Late June, the report came out late June, so in late August, we're going to provide a 60-day update. Because as you can imagine, as they were doing this work, they're telling us about urgent things that need to be attended to. So some of the recommendations have actually already been addressed. And we're going to allow kind of this consistent process of us saying what needs to be done, how it's being done, how it's being handled, what's being prioritized. And so you should pay attention for an update in the next couple of weeks that will explain where we have come from, even in the short time, and what will happen next. Awesome. So the last thing I would want you to talk to is what do you see as the relationship between addressing some of the stuff in the guidepost report and the work that we're doing around ordination? Yeah, happy to. Um, in many ways, it, it's, it's parallel and linked in a couple of different ways. If we call that stress test analogy, um, a stress test is intended to identify weakness for the sake of strengthening your system. So if a recommendation regarding these issues is to move towards shared ordination processes, that is intended to strengthen our system for the sake of stewarding the gift that God has given us into the future for the sake of the church, the world, our children, grandchildren, and if God is kind to us, our great-grandchildren. Amen? Amen? So it is a strengthening process. In many ways, the ordination recommendations and the things we're undertaking in relationship to guideposts is a strengthening process. But there's also a disconnect that we want to make sure we're clear about, even in this moment. Um, I don't know if you've, you've been in an ordination process as a pastor, maybe a board member. If you have a board meeting, and, and you hear in that board meeting, we need to ordain somebody right now. <laughs> That's the wrong attitude of ordination. Ordination is not a response to crisis or an urgent thing. Ordination is a discerning thing. It's a process by which we examine, God, what are you doing and who are you doing it with? And how can we affirm from the outside the things we see God cultivating from the inside? So, ordination is a process of slow, wise discernment that is Caleb's responsibility to work with the lead team and our pastors and national team to say, what's the right pace? What's the right timing? There are things in the report, though, that are urgent and need to be addressed immediately. So just by visual, I'm just going to separate Caleb and I. <laughs> Caleb is ordination. Rob Morgan is crisis. Take one more step to the left. <laughs> Caleb's work is to steward a process that honors the Lord, honors people, and is an embodied work of God in our midst. My job is to look at the stuff that's broken right now and say, how do we move towards it quickly for the sake of those we have been asked to shepherd in our local communities yeah. and as a movement? So those two things ought to feel different. Yeah. Your work and mine are connected for the strengthening of our movement, and they're disconnected for the way in which certain decisions will be made in the near future. Yeah. Is that helpful? I think so. Is that helpful? Wonderful. So who am I? Crisis. Crisis. Who is Caleb? I think there's some Pixar movie that will be made eventually yeah. about the two of us yes. on this journey through Rob and Caleb's amazing Rob and adventure. Caleb's amazing adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rob. Appreciate it. So in light of that super helpful clarification about the work that we're doing not being the work of crisis management, 
but a work that God has given to us to do for the moment that we're in, a work of articulation of our particular calling as a movement so that we can steward the thing God's given us for generations. Let's just talk for a little bit now about, in the broadest and most basic sense, what is ordination? I got a working definition uh, up on the slide. It's got some underlines. I'll read it to you, and then I'll talk about each piece that's underlined because I think those are the key moving parts, right? Ordination is the means by which a community discerns and affirms a gift of the Holy Spirit given to a particular person who's being set apart for a particular work of ministry. I'll just read it one more time. Ordination is the means by which a community discerns and affirms a gift of the Holy Spirit given to a particular person who's being set apart for a particular work of ministry. Let me just talk to each of those for a second. Ordination is a means. What does that mean? The, the fundamental thing to take away from that is that ordination is a process. Like Rob said, we don't ordain people urgently. There's never a moment in which someone must be ordained right now within the vineyard system. In fact, what ordination is doing is we're developing a means, a way of doing something, a way that we can look to and say, you know what, this is a wise, thoughtful, well-articulated, stable process by which we can name who is a vineyard pastor based on what we believe a vineyard pastor should be, know, and do. Now, some folks are probably thinking, why can't we just hurry up and do it more quickly? It feels like those are not super hard questions. And to some degree, those questions are happily, and we'll talk about this in a, in a moment, more clear uh, than they could be. It's great. We have, we have more clarity than we're not starting from zero, right? We have a lot of shared consensus about what a vineyard pastor should be, know, and do. But the reason that we're going slow is that we're trying to pay attention to all of the different contingencies that are in front of us in this moment so that we don't have to continually reinvent the system right? It's better now. We have a phrase that we use on our national team. Let's go slow to go fast, right? We're going to go slow now, making sure that we're covering the bases so that when it's time to move, we can move quickly. Some other folks are probably thinking, well, why are you only talking about senior pastors? Why do we just need to ordain senior pastors? I would say, no, that's actually not all that we're thinking about, but we're starting with senior pastors first because this definition is most fully applicable to senior pastors. I've been thinking of everything that's underlined uh, up on the slide there as like uh, faders on a soundboard. I'm sure many of you, along with your pastoral call, are also accomplished sound technicians because that's what ministry is. And um, each of these things is like a fader. For a senior pastor, all of these things are up at 10, right? For others, for people who are associate pastors or worship pastors or functioning in different uh, settings in relationship to the marketplace or uh, et cetera, et cetera, some of those faders will be adjusted. So we're going to start with the full on 10 out of 10 in every way. And then once we've gotten clear on that, we'll adjust in a manner that represents the reality of all of what the vineyard is, right? Ordination is a means. It's a process. It's a way of doing something. We're developing a good process, something that we can feel confident in. Ordination is the means by which a community discerns and affirms. Let's focus on community for a second. Ordination is community-based, by which I mean ordination carries our identity in it. It's a process that carries part of our identity. There's no generic ordination into Christian ministry, right? Well, you could probably get it on the internet. <laughs> but but, but, but in, in real churches, there's no generic ordination, what there actually is, is ordination that says, we, a community, we, the vineyard, are saying that you are of us. You are a pastor and a leader in the vineyard movement, and that means a certain set of things, right? Historically, ordination is not only to a community, but also to a particular place. There are many examples in, uh, throughout the history of the church where when somebody moves the place they're in, they have to transfer their ordination or they even have to reimagine the way their ordination initially worked because ordination is to community, which means it's sort of being bound to a particular people, right? Does that make sense? And in this case, the work that we're doing, you can see the way that that connects to this work of stewarding our gift, right? We're saying, who are we as vineyard people? Ordination is the means by which a community 
discerns and affirms the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is something that I think we have a pretty natural step for, something that we're quite aware of as vineyard people. That is that God initiates ordination processes. God starts them, we recognize them, and we shepherd them, or we midwife them, as an image I like a lot, right? We are discerning and affirming the work that God is doing in an ordination process, right? Ordination is the means by which a community discerns and affirms a gift of the Spirit given by God to a particular person who's being set apart. I think I want to just focus for a moment on the set-apartness in the vineyard, and we'll talk about this later. We have a high, high value on everyone gets to play, and I think sometimes that has caused us to not really reckon with the fact that God does, in fact, set people apart for works of ministry. We see it throughout the scripture, but there are times where I think as vineyard leaders, we've thought to ourselves, ah, maybe I'm just pretty much like everybody else in my church. And that's honestly, as humble as that is, it's not a very good way of thinking about what the role of a pastor is in a community. Because the spirit, in faithfulness to us and, and, and to the work of God in the world, does set people apart, gives people distinct roles. So ordination is a way in which we are developing articulation around what are the distinct roles that God is giving to people? Why? For a particular work of ministry. To offer a particular service to the community. That's the way that I'm thinking about ordination. It's my working definition. It may adjust over time. But I think it covers the basis of why we're doing the work, the way in which we're doing the work, and sort of what we generally think we're doing. If we look at scripture, and I don't have time to do this now, but if we look at scripture, we just see this pattern, the pattern of the things I just described, basically everywhere. Moses appointing Joshua as his successor, or the empowering of the 70 elders in Numbers 11, or Jesus' appointment of the apostles, or the apostles appointing the seven ministers in Acts 6. It's a great example. Paul and Barnabas being commissioned, and on and on and on and on. There are... Uh, endless examples of the way that God uh, does this kind of work in setting people apart for the sake of their communities with a kind of clarifying and empowering uh, identity. And then in the history of the church, we see it. What's really interesting in the history of the church to me is that we could look all the way over at like high liturgical Episcopal frameworks like in the, the Roman Catholic Church, and we could go all the way on the other side to like the sort of anti-institutional Quakers who are the soil from which the vineyard was grown. And what we would recognize is that the same patterns are present there. Many, many different ways of doing it. But the awareness that what we're doing is responding to something that God has done by creating a means for identifying a person who's being set apart for the good of communities, that's everywhere across the spectrum in the history of the church. And that's the work that we're doing in front of us right now. Uh, a way of thinking about the, the stages of the work could be we're doing a work of articulation, of discernment, and of resourcing, right? We're naming our commitments, we're witnessing those who are uh, leading others in those commitments, and then we're equipping the people who are doing that work for the work of ministry, right? We're doing this work together, and I say we're doing it together because when we ask a question like, what should a vineyard pastor be, know, and do, the fundamental sources of that knowledge, in part, are you, <laughs> or sitting in this room. How many of you guys participated in an area meeting where you talked about ordination? I see some hands on that. Right, so that's been really, really wonderful. We had a huge amount of uh, productive response to the area meetings that we ran as the very first step of this process to ask every vineyard pastor to comment on what do they think a vineyard pastor should be, know, and do. Because as we're doing ordination work, there are four basic sources that flow into uh, the, the kind of defining of what should a vineyard pastor be, know, and do. The first is uh, Holy Scripture, and specifically the life and ministry of Jesus, against whom we measure all of our Christian discipleship, right? The second would be the witness of the historic church and the global church. 
The third would be the unique and particular story of the vineyard, our movement. And then the fourth would be the experience of vineyard pastors today. And what we decided to do as we began the process was start with the fourth, the experience of vineyard pastors today, and ask every pastor in our movement to sit down and have a conversation with the leaders in their area about what they think a vineyard pastor should be, know, and do, and then give us feedback on that conversation through some online forums and ways that we could actually hear what people are saying. So as you can imagine, we got more than we bargained for when we asked uh, for that feedback. We got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really thoughtful thoughtful responses from people all over the country, right? And I'm working uh, with a great team, including uh, my assistant, Lindsay Maldonado, and the project manager, Krista Peebles, who are both here. And, and Krista and Lindsay started to break down the data, the responses that we were getting into categories and say, well, you know, these people are saying these kinds of things, these kinds of things, etc. cetera. And uh, they did a wonderful job and pretty quickly realized that no matter how wonderful a job they did, this work was kind of overwhelming. So we actually hired a data analyst, <laughs> never hired a data analyst before, but I had occasion to do this here, a person with a PhD in this, sort of, this kind of work, uh, to tell us what it was that we were hearing from the pastors in Vineyard USA. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about some of what the top line work is. It's actually very uh, encouraging to see what she saw. So uh, there's a lot, uh, a lot to say, and I'm only going to say a little right now. The entire report that she wrote, uh, the, of the data analyst wrote, is available on the ordination website. So if any of you have stomach to read a 50-page report about what all of us think a vineyard pastor should be, know, and do, broken down into careful categories, by all means, be my guest. I think you would enjoy it. I enjoyed it. But if you're not wanting to read the entire report, let me give you some top-line stuff. This is all on the website, too. Um, what we heard from vineyard pastors about what should a vineyard pastor be? Grounded in kingdom theology. Isn't that great? Right off the top, one of the most important things, we all agree on it. Guided to and connect, or guided by and connected to the Holy Spirit. Wonderful, that's exactly what a vineyard pastor should be. A humble servant of integrity who's called to ministry and a lover of Jesus, a lover of God. So guys, the fact that you're like, well, duh, this is great news. What this means is there's a kind of consensus that even though we haven't had clarity and articulation in sort of written form or process form over decades, we have a shared understanding because God's been taking care of the vineyard, right? We're not in some kind of wild crisis moment where everything's on the table. We know some things and we know them together. What should a vineyard pastor know? Another piece of great news, the Bible, <laughs> right? Not a given. A vineyard pastor should know the Bible and be able to teach, guide, and preach vineyard values, history, and theology. I think this is just so wonderful. It's encouraging and affirming of who we are and who we're becoming. And also a vineyard pastor should know how to utilize resources, mentors, and other one-on-one -on -one support, as well as formal training programs. Good news, we know we need these things. We're beginning to ask for them, and we're asking for them in such a way that they hit the top line of a report of all kinds of feedback coming in. So it's good news, it tells us some stuff. And then finally, what should a vineyard pastor do? The work of guiding, discipling, leading, and shepherding others. I'm sure that reflects all of your lives in one way or another. And the work of being with God and guiding others to God. Isn't that great? That's what a vineyard pastor should be, know, and do according to the conversation that our movement had uh, this spring. We also heard some interesting things about what we need moving forward, which I want to name because these essentially take the form of commitments from our team to you as vineyard pastors and leaders. One thing we heard was we really, really want clarity about the ordination process. What's happening? What will it entail? And what impact will the things that are happening have on pastors and churches? So our commitment as a team to the vineyard is that we will be as clear as we possibly can in as many ways as we possibly can be to, to demonstrate what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what impact it will have. Uh, some of what we're doing in the seminar is a response to that desire. This is being recorded. It's going to be available for anybody who wants to watch it. The second thing is folks said they wanted indication that the feedback that's being given is actually being incorporated into the ongoing ordination discernment process. Very, very helpful, right? When we're asking folks to fill out, you know, online forms and participate in conversations and things like that, it's a very natural thing to say, is anyone actually going to read this? 
Is this like a comment card at the restaurant where it's like straight into the trash? Or, or is this going to be meaningful? And just so you know, part of what we've done since the area meetings is we've circled around with, uh, we intended all nine regions, we had to reschedule two, so seven of the nine regions with the regional leaders and all the area leaders to hear feedback from each area leader about the ways their meetings went, anything we thought we should be paying attention to alongside the data that we've already received. And to me, one of the most encouraging things was that we consistently heard from area and regional leaders that one thing they were observing is that we were clearly paying attention to what was being said. So if you feel that you have something that needs to be said uh, that you maybe think isn't being heard adequately, my recommendation to you would be first to go to your area leader. We're using the area and regional structures a lot in this process. And you can also contact us. We're committed to hearing the feedback that's being given to us. And then finally, the third thing folks said that they really needed was a conversation about the relationship between national ordination and the historic autonomy of local churches. And we're gonna do some of that later on. So the question of, of local church autonomy. Uh, just to wrap this up, one area leader captured what I think was a very broad sentiment. I was pleased, again, when this data analyst said to us, you know, there's a lot of hope in this report. And she gave me this quote. She said, an area leader says, our group was excited and hopeful in what it seems like is gonna come from this process. Beyond just ordination, this will help our movement get on the same page, be more unified and connected, which will surely fan the flames of the kingdom in our churches. Good news, right? So I was actually quite encouraged by that. I encourage you, go on the ordination website, check out either the top line stuff that I just showed you or the full report if you like. So that's the work we've done so far, naming the experience of vineyard pastors on the ground. What's interesting to me is, I mean, it's kind of obvious, I guess, but so much of the fourth source, that is the experience of vineyard pastors on the ground, continually calls back to the other three, right? The life and ministry of Jesus and the Holy Scripture, uh, the historic church, the global church, and the unique story of the vineyard itself. And I want to unpack that a little bit today. So I'd like to invite a member of the ordination lead team, Ted Kim, my dear friend, Ted Kim, to come and have a conversation with me about these things. So let's welcome Ted to the stage. So Ted, I know you have a couple questions for me, but as we're getting started, I'd like to ask you a question. At our last national leadership conversation, some folks will remember you gave a talk on uh, the past and the future. And you talked about how we shouldn't be slavishly imitating our past as we move towards our future, but instead you use the metaphor of rhyming our future with our past. Can you just remind us a little bit of what that was about? Because I think it's helpful for the moment we're in right now. Yeah, just really briefly. Yeah. Uh, this is a really a question about what to do with the past yeah. and how to be faithful to the past, which is the conversation that I hope we can have here in the next few moments. Mm -hmm. What does it look like to actually be faithful to the past? Uh, and what does it look like to be faithful to the past while still holding on to the biblical reality that God is alive and well yeah. and continually surprises us with his mercy and goodness yes. and is doing new things in our midst as we are part of the unfolding story of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, he does these surprising and unpredictable plot twists that is for our extreme good. Yeah. And so what does that actually look like? How do, we, how do we do that in a manner that feels like it's not divorcing us from the past, it's not slavishly imitating the past, mm -hmm. but it's, to use the metaphor of Lutheran theologian Robert Jensen, it's actually rhyming with the past. Yeah. It's a new thing that has the same quality, same character, mm -hmm. same convictions, same core values, yeah. same rootedness in the biblical story. Doing all those things, it's new, but it's still rooted in all of those all of those things. And oh, by the way, God is alive and well. It turns out. <laughs> he <Yeah>. turns out. <laughs> and oh, by the way, if you're dead, one thing that you cannot do is anything new. <laughs> Hopefully. If, <laughs> yeah. If you're dead, you have... You have seriously lost <laughs> the capacity to surprise yes. and do new things. Yes. But of course, we know that a person will do things that, that are consistent with who they are, even though it might be new and surprising. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and I think that's the question that I want to give to you. What does sure. it look like as we are historic Christians? Mm. Uh, we have been followers. We are followers of the way of Jesus uh, in companionship with followers of the way of Jesus over two millennia and all across the globe. Yeah. What does it look like for us to rhyme? Yeah. And what does it look like for us to do that as it relates to the ordination process? Yeah, I mean, that is, I think, the right question, <laughs> right? I think there's a very simple answer to what it looks like for us to live in continuity with the past while also rhyming and finding new ways forward. I'll say it simply and then we can talk about it a little bit. But the simple answer would be when it comes to our theology and when it comes to the practice of our faith, we don't get to make stuff up, <laughs> right? We are not starting from scratch because the Holy Spirit touched people in our movement in the 70s and 80s. And now we get to invent what it means to be a Christian, right? Even if we understand ourselves or have understood ourselves at one time or another to be on the cutting edge of a move of God, say, right? Even if that's true, we are always already connected to people all around the world and across time who, on whose shoulders we stand yeah. and who tell us what it is to be a Christian. Right. Their story is the beginning of our story. Their story is the story in which we stand in continuity. We don't get to make things up, right? So in the vineyard, we've said uh, for years that we are orthodox evangelicals who love the whole church. Right Now, I'm aware of our dear friend John Mumford, who often <laughs> says, the trouble with words is you don't know where they've been. <laughs> so for some of us, when we hear the phrase, orthodox evangelicals who love the whole church, we might not know what those words mean, and we also might be a little uncomfortable, right? When we hear the word orthodox, we might imagine men with beards and large hats swinging censers around that, you know, blow beautiful smoke into a, into a lovely church. That doesn't represent most of our churches, maybe any, right? When we hear evangelical, we might get a little leery for other reasons, politics, for example, right? Or ways in which that word hits the press, that feels like, ooh, I don't want to be associated with that. You know, and of course, when we began to refer to ourselves as Orthodox evangelicals who love the whole church, we hadn't lived through things like the politicization of evangelicalism in the manner that we've lived right. through it in the last several years right. in this country. Uh, we did a podcast recently with Bruce Hindmarsh, which uh, I don't have a slide for this, but I recommend you check it out on the We Are Vineyard podcast if you're interested in this. A professor at Regent College named Bruce Hindmarsh who talked to us about, he's one of the leading historians of evangelicalism in the world, and he talked to us about the fact that when you say the word evangelical, you mustn't think about the present. You have to think about the fact that this is a historic and a global phenomenon. And that allows you to consider the present. You don't deny the present, but you have to reckon with the breadth of what we mean by that right. before we start to uh, panic, <laughs> right? right? So, I mean, this is John Wimber. He said, I purposely set out to center our movement around an orthodox evangelical theology and practice. The question in front of us is really, what does that mean, yeah. right? What does that mean for us now? Um, the first couple of things I, I would just want to say about that is it means that everything we do has to be rooted in the teaching of the historic and the global church, yeah. right? That means the church has a learned witness, right? As the church was born at Pentecost and grew, it began to articulate its identity in ways that were really, really important, not just for knowing its theology, but for making its disciples, yes. right? Yes. For articulating its distinctives, for leading people into the future that Jesus promised with a kind of faithfulness that could enable you to, if necessary, die for what it is that you believed. I mean, nobody wants to be a martyr, but the fact is the church was built on a culture of martyrdom yeah. where we would rather die than betray our Lord, right? right? That's a very, very different thing from any form of cultural Christianity, yeah. right? Or any form of uh, sort of uh, Christianity that can be appropriated by anything else. In the kingdom of God, there is one king. That's right. yeah. Amen. And every other authority must bow. Amen. So Amen. when we're talking about what it means to be people rooted in the teaching of the church, we have to learn what the witness of the church is, yes. right? Yes. And then we have to train in a manner 
that reflects that awareness, right? right? So one of the great things about the vineyard I, that I just love so much, and one of the main reasons I'm in the vineyard probably, is that um, our practices, the things that we natively know, the stuff we began with, like, can I pray for you right now, right? Uh, the teaching of the scripture in simple ways, worship to the Lord, love for the poor. Our practices are very, very much reflective of the life of the New Testament church, mm -hmm. right? Now, we're not the only way, and there are many ways we can improve, but we've learned a lot about who to be from some of that axiom. I, I think Wimber said this. He said, you know, I want us all to know the scripture, but above all, I want us to live biblical lives, yeah. Yeah. right? We can talk about what the scripture says or doesn't say on any given issue, but we should be living lives that look like the people in the scripture, right? Not all the people in the scripture, just the good ones. Um, but, but in that sense, I think in some ways, someone, a theologian said to me once, in the vineyard, your practices are sometimes smarter than your ideas, right? We know things in, in our habits, in ways that we haven't yet articulated theologically, but, but they're in us. So, when we're interacting with the learned witness of the church, part of what we have to do is keep doing what we already know right. is at the center of gospel witness in our practices. Amen. Then I think we also have to do theological teaching that goes alongside that about the why and the how and the witness of the church in that way. And then we have to keep the heart that we have as well because we all know that you can have any number of good practices, you can have all the right theology, but it's really the way that God touches our hearts and forms yeah. us into followers, yeah. forms us into disciples, that makes everything else go. Okay, yeah. so I have a follow-up question okay. to that, which yeah. is, I mean, as a local church pastor myself, I hear everything that you're articulating as the kind of beautiful posture yeah. by which we would approach our Christian life mm -hmm. and in, in our church community. Yeah. And it just occurs to me how how do you stay in that posture? The, the thing that you just mm -hmm. described, yeah. what does it look like to actually hold to that posture sure. and not drift? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say in relationship to sort of understanding our lives connected to the historic witness of the church, I would say there's a few things because there, obviously there are many things we'd want to consider. But on this point particularly, number one, I think we have to cultivate a biblical imagination. I don't have time to teach on what that would mean. But I want to just refer folks again to the podcast that we did specifically with Carmen Imes and with Nije Gupta. We talked a lot, Jay and I, with them, and these are renowned Bible scholars, wonderful teachers, lovers of the church. We talked a lot with them about what does it mean to cultivate a biblical imagination so that when we read the text, we actually know their story and we know our story. Nije's new book is called Tell Her Story. It's about the way that when you read scripture carefully and with an informed imagination, you start to see the fact that there are women leaders at every level all over the New Testament, right? There are ways in which we don't see that when we come quickly to the scripture without cultivating a biblical imagination, right? And there's lots more to say about that, but I would really encourage folks to listen to those podcasts. I think it's a helpful flag for thinking about that. The second thing I would want to say is we need to cultivate a creedal imagination. Now, how many people in this room have ever heard that the vineyard is a non-credal movement? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, there's a few. In each room, there's been more or less of folks. To be totally honest, I just have literally no idea what that means. Because Christianity is a creedal movement, okay? So I think we may mean, well, the vineyard hasn't written a creed called the Vineyard Creed, right? But Christianity is a, non, is a creedal movement. We have fundamental creeds that have been developed by the church over time that articulate what it is that we believe. The creeds do some really interesting things. They distill the arc of our theology, right? A creed is a short, simple distillation of what it is that Christians believe. If we look at the Apostles' Creed, you know, it begins with, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, right? We could, um, we could write a library of books in fact, this has been done. Libraries of books have been written about the fatherhood of God and what all those things mean. We don't have to become theologians. We simply have to know that it's irreducible, if you're a follower of Jesus, that you believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, right? Creeds distill. Creeds also teach. I don't know if you guys know this, but the function of creeds 
in the history of the church was not just to, to distill theology, but it was actually to equip people for baptism, right? People would be baptized in the form of usually question and answer in the early time between the rule of faith and the development of the Apostles' Creed. So the person baptizing would say, do you believe in God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth? And you would say yes, and boom, down you would go. And they'd usually baptize you three times in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, we all have different baptismal practices, and we can rhyme with this. We don't have to imitate it. But what we do have to reckon with is the fact that this is the manner in which the church has formed disciples for millennia, Amen. right? Yes. We cannot go outside of fundamental creedal orthodoxy right. while we're making disciples and expect to stay on the road, right? right? So creeds distill, they teach, and honestly, they also challenge, right? I think it's really interesting to spend time reading a creed that refers to, say, uh, the second coming of Jesus, right? In our church, the second coming has come up recently, but it, when it came up, I, I thought, you know, we don't really teach very much on Jesus's return, right? There are like doctrines that were okay to stand up in a Starbucks and affirm, right? I think even the resurrection, it's like I could stand up in a Starbucks and say, I affirm the resurrection of Jesus. But for many of us, there's a little awkwardness around affirming some of those doctrines, like uh, you know, Jesus is coming back and you think, oh man, that's like what the crazy guy on the college campus spends their time saying, right? I don't know. I don't even know how to relate to that. And, and again, I'm sure we know how to relate to it in, in, in various ways, but the point is that the creeds don't let us forget. In fact, they require us to be challenged by the fundamental witness of the church, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So what the church has affirmed we must pay attention to, even if it feels inconvenient or frankly irrelevant, right? right? Even if it feels like, mm, that doesn't fit into my sermon series this year or for the next three years. We find ourselves ending up with pet doctrines that work well for us, and then sometimes we put things in the shadows, right? I don't think we want to put things in the shadows. The creeds call us into the light of the full witness of the church. And while I'm on this point, by the way, I want to recommend a couple of uh, resources to you guys that we've had in the bookstore. This one is a little book on the Apostles' Creed by Ben Myers uh, for adults. And this one, which I know is sold out, but you uh, can get it online. We have a QR code for a discount uh, for these two books. This one is for kids, the Apostles' Creed for all God's children. And it's probably my favorite of the two. <laughs> it's a beautiful beautiful book that allows you not just to know what the creed says, but to unpack it in a way even a kid would understand. And if a kid can understand it, it's possible that even an adult could understand it too. <laughs> so I, I would recommend those books to you. Oh, and also, um, while we're on the question of sort of creedal communities in the early church, there's actually two authors in the vineyard in the U.S. who've written about this. Uh, Jared Boyd, the new book, uh, finding Freedom in Constraint about spiritual disciplines in the early church. And uh, Brock Bingaman, who's a pastor in Oklahoma City, has a book called A Luminous Life, A Journey into Classic Christian Spirituality. Both of those are in the bookstore. This is not like a promo pitch, but if you want to grow deeper with people who are also in this room, that might be a, a great way to do that. So, biblical imagination, Ted, creedal imagination, and then finally, a historical and a global imagination, right? We've mentioned this already. One way to think about this would be this. When we think about anything as Christians, whether it be old and maybe especially when we think about things that are new, we never, never, never think alone. Christians never think alone. We think with the witness of the church over time and across geography, right? So... Um, Jay and I had the occasion to do a podcast with Mark Knoll, a very eminent historian of Christianity, and also with Hannah Nation, who's a woman who's working on uh, translating and making available the sermons and essays of pastors in the Chinese house church movement uh, for uh, English-speaking readers. When we talked to them, they continually underlined the fact that as Christians in the U.S., or frankly, in any context, we see what we see and we don't see what we don't see, right? right? That's why it's endlessly important for us to make sure that we're never thinking alone because our blind spots will catch up to us, right? We need to be paying attention to the things that people are saying globally and have said historically because they see things that we don't see. 
For instance, in, in the, you know, the Chinese house churches, it was news to me that many of those churches are not in hiding. Many of them have a thousand people and meet in hotel ballrooms, right? But they exist under continual threat of being shut down or persecuted by the government in China. And so their relationship to nationalism and national governments is very, very different from our relationship to national government. Their theology of Christian identity around what it means to exist in public can help us. That's right. They can help us because they see things we don't Amen. and they're paying a price so that we can grow. Amen. In the same way, may we one day pay a price so that they can grow, yes. right? So biblical imagination, creedal imagination, historical and global imagination. Yeah. 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 So with respect to that yeah. and this ordination process, uh, could you distill the work to do? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I may have said something like this already. I, I just want to say it super clearly. The work that we're doing in relationship to the stuff we've just been talking about, which would be retrieving fundamentals from the historic and the global church, as well as from scripture, right? We're naming the commitments of the vineyard. What should a vineyard pastor be, know, and do is connected to naming our commitments so that when we can see clearly through those lenses, we can discern together, obviously at a local level primarily, and then in relationship to our shared identity that we're going to name, we can discern who's God setting apart to lead. Right. Right. Who are the people that God's raising up in our communities to lead us? And then adequately work together to equip those people so that they themselves can become equippers of others, right? right. So it's, it's articulating, it's discerning, and then it's resourcing. And that feels so much like this is who we are. I think it's who that's we are. That's who we are. I think that's true. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ted. Can we thank Ted? So I want to uh, invite Amanda Clark, another member of the ordination lead team. She's a pastor in Indiana up to the stage. Yeah, give her a hand. So... I want to talk now, we, we've, ta we've talked a lot at kind of 30,000 feet about some of the big picture inputs into the work that we're doing, as well as some of the research and, and data that we've, that we've developed so far. For the rest of our time, I want to talk about nuts and bolts. What are we doing around some of the biggest questions that we've received? And also, uh, what does the road ahead look like? Um, Amanda, let's just start with you. What are one or two of the key things that you're excited about as you see the work that we're doing? Well, I'll just tell a little story. Uh, my husband, Justin, and I were uh, started going to a vineyard church 18 years ago when we got married. And almost immediately, we began experiencing that really great thing we do in the vineyard of relational leadership development. The, you know, leadership is best caught or taught, <laughs> caught, not taught. And uh, I had a very ideal experience of relational leader development. I was given a voice. My opinions mattered. I was given opportunities to lead. My giftings and callings were affirmed. But in my corner of the vineyard, ordination for women was not and is not a given. And so leaders would say things to me like, Amanda, we see your giftings. We can't wait to see what God does in your life. But they didn't say, hey, Amanda, what if we went on a journey together to co-discern if you have a pastoral calling on your life? And so uh, over time that did begin to happen. I was really encouraged by our former uh, regional leader, Ray Beefus, to pursue uh, whether or not I was called to pastoral ministry. And uh, my, my dear friend, Tara Brown, encouraged me as she was the first lady pastor in our area. And uh, it was through that process that I began to discern my call, but it was often a lonely process in my area. And I wonder if I wouldn't have had to wait until I was 38 to be ordained. Hmm. And, I, and so if a process with more clarity would have been helpful to me. And also I think along similar lines a process of clarity would have given me confidence. So uh, once I did begin to pastor, I, which I've only been doing for two and a half years. It's all really fresh and new to me, you know. Mm. And, I, and once I did begin to do that, preaching um, every, you know, eight weeks or so as part of a preaching team on a staff is different than preaching most Sundays. Yeah. 
And so uh, suddenly I realized like, wow, I have a week to get my head around the doctrine of atonement. <laughs> and, and at that point I was in uh, partway through a seminary program at Northern Seminary. And so I had been given tools to like know which scholars I could trust and know how to find their work. And, and, and I thought to myself, if I wasn't in school right now, how would I ever be doing this on a weekly basis? I would be, you know, looking up workingpreacher.com and trying to find some article, you know. And it, it, I, I think that a theological process in our ordination framework would have given me confidence to begin preaching regularly. And then another area of confidence would have uh, just been a process that would have instilled in me the firm knowledge that I did have what it takes. Mm. Uh, when I was asked by a, a pastor to take over his church, I met with our area and our regional leader, and they said, Amanda, we've known you for 15 years. We've been walking with you. We trust you. You can do this. And, and like, wow, what a gift, yeah. you know, to be trusted in that way. But they were sort of like, go forth and prosper, you know? And <laughs> It'll be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. so great. And uh, without um, some, a process that would have taken me through steps, a supervised ministry process, perhaps, it felt like the only measures of my success that they had made a good decision to put their trust in me was, you know, whether or not I was growing the church and and baptizing people. And in two and a half years, I've grown my church from 65 adults to 75 adults. <laughs> and so, and so there were moments where I thought they trusted me, but was that a good idea? And so I think a, a process where I would have been more uh, closely supervised and given mentoring along the way would have been uh, helpful to my confidence. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I'm really encouraged by the fact that those are the things that you see happening because all of those things would be things that we have to be attentive to and affirming in leaders if we're going to develop the leaders that God is raising up, right? It can't be only how big is your church because there's all kinds of ways to grow big churches. Some of them are wonderful and some of them are really pretty disastrous, yeah. right? Size is not the only thing that should be the right measure of success. And so that requires discernment. And I, I'm super glad to hear you say that that work, you see this work connected to that. Yeah, and yeah. along those lines, I have a couple questions for you. I'm in. So <laughs> one of the... I knew it was <laughs> so as we've uh, begun discussion with area leaders, with local pastors, with regional leaders, we've had some questions that have bubbled up to the surface as the most common. Mm. And so one of those is, uh, as you know, one of our key values is everyone gets to play mm -hmm. and isn't moving towards an ordination framework sort of in conflict with the value of everyone gets to play. Yeah, that's such a good and important question. So the first thing I would want to say about uh, the value of everyone gets to play is, frankly, it's not just a value, it's a biblical reality, right? God uses everyone. The Spirit is at work everywhere. We shouldn't be surprised by this. And in fact, as pastors and leaders in the Vineyard Movement, we should be continually paying attention to the ways that the Spirit's at work so that we can be midwifing that thing, right? Everybody gets to be a part of the work that the Spirit is doing in the world. And the more you say yes to the things that the Lord is doing in your life, the more like Jesus you're going to become, right? Everyone gets to play as a fundamental biblical reality. Now, a really interesting biblical example of everyone gets to play is Balaam's donkey. <laughs> Right? Balaam's donkey was very efficient and effective and empowered to give the word of the Lord. I don't think we should ordain Balaam's donkey because of that. <laughs> right? Of course, nobody would think that. I think there's a difference between acknowledging the biblical reality that everyone gets to play and recognizing that some people are being specifically set apart if, to give their whole lives or to give a portion of their whole lives in the manner of uh, certain other kinds of callings, right? God sets people apart for the work of ministry. This is the experience of the New Testament church. It's the experience of the history of the church and all different sorts. It's the experience in our, in our movement right now. We know that this is true. I just think we need to be supporting people in the fact 
that some are set apart. So I see literally no tension between our value of everyone gets to play and the process of discerning ordination. Also, I would say that in the, in the work of ordaining a pastor or a leader, a huge part of what we do because we're vineyard people is recognize that the role of a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, right? So a good vineyard pastor is never not going to be equipping people, leading them to play, so I, I think all of this is moving in the same direction. Yeah. That's real good. Thank you. Uh, another one of our commonly stated values um, of the vineyard regards the autonomy of the local church. Yeah. And so how does moving towards a shared and national framework for ordination affect our understanding of, of that value? Yeah, no, that's, again, a really important question, one of the main ones we get. I think here, again, it's good to take our cues uh, from John Wimber because he was the first person to even really introduce the language of autonomy in a, in a structured way into the vineyard's imagination, right? In that article, the one I was talking about earlier uh, that's on the ordination website, Wimber, he endorses local church autonomy with an important caveat. He says, I, I endorse autonomy, quote, within the constraints of the values, theology, and genetic code of the vineyard, right? So we've never actually in the vineyard had radical autonomy. Vineyard pastors are not free to add a fourth member to the Trinity. Vineyard pastors are not free to take multiple spouses, right? Vineyard pastors are not free to invent a form of Christianity that is different from historic and global Christianity and expect that it'll just be okay because we have something called autonomy, right? There are constraints and there always have been. Now, Wimber was not always clear and we have not always been clear in Vineyard USA around what the values, theology, and genetic code of the vineyard are. It's one thing to say we have the constraints. It's another thing to make them clear so that they can actually be useful and, and upbuilding to the pastors who are trying to live within them, right? But what I'm quite aware of is that there are things that we know that what we see that when we've asked vineyard pastors, what should we be, know, and do? And there's that much consistency. We know a lot about what it means to have the values, theology, and genetic code of the vineyard. The work we're doing now in part is to get much, much clearer on, on what those things actually mean for the sake of giving a huge amount or just continuing in, in essentially autonomy and freedom in relationship to mission, right? Everybody lives in different places. You guys know where you live. You know your place. You know your church. You know what you're called to do. There's radical freedom in respect to mission and vineyard churches. There's also a good deal of freedom in respect to how we organize, right? There are all kinds of ways in which it's possible to lead your church in a way that's both legal and faithful, right? Um, you don't have to uh, adopt very, very strict postures. We've always had a posture of liberty in those things because it feels suitable to enabling and equipping pastors to pursue the mission they actually have. So there's autonomy and freedom in those places. However, there's always been constraints around values, theology, and genetic code. And the work that we're doing right now is work to get clearer on that. That's work we're doing in public over time so that people can see, weigh in, and, and help us to get it right. Yeah. So that's how I see that relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It does, yeah. And another question that's been bubbling to the surface is, all right, Caleb, like I can see the benefits of ordination for getting us more organized as a movement, mm -hmm. but why is ordination good and important for local churches and local pastors? Like what's the benefit? In other words, what's in it for me? That's a great question. I, I'm gonna talk to that, but first I'd love to direct your attention to a, a short video. What we're talking about today is how do we lead a movement that lasts? How do we lead a movement that goes beyond one or two generations into a place where we can say, God's given us a gift in the vineyard movement. We have to steward it. And the work we've been doing from the very beginning all the way through to the reorg that we've just done is connected to that. So as we grow, you know, and we naturally want to do things together because, mm -hmm. you know, when you do things together, they can be bigger and they can be more effective yeah. and you can affect more people. If the people who are doing those things have gone through this process of ordination, yeah. then they're all, at least when it comes to the key values, the non-negotiable values, the mm -hmm. things we want to be commonly denominated about, yeah. they're all on the same page. Yes. 
So what it fundamentally has to do with, and I think this is absolutely at the center for us, is care for pastors and care for the flock, care yeah. for local churches. Absolutely. The ways in which having an overarching structure uh, can assist local pastors to stay healthy and strong and equipped and, you know, between the ditches on the road, as it were, and local churches to have recourse if things get difficult and some shared identity along the way. Right. Yeah. And because we're, we're in a long haul business here. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not just trying to like keep our churches alive till Jesus comes back in 1984. Yeah. We, we're actually now settling into the task. Let's build something our grandchildren can benefit from. Isn't that amazing? And maybe if, if God is good, even our great grandchildren. Yeah. My dream for the vineyard is that my kids would be able to raise up their kids in faith in a vineyard church without worrying about gaps or without worrying about um, false teaching or absolutely so i hope that this work contributes to that awesome so uh, on the ordination website uh there's a probably a 25 minute conversation that i had with steve as well as the two minute video and we've chopped it up into some sections as well where i'm just asking steve to reflect on you know his, his convictions around this process he was part of the reorg and and uh Tell us about the benefits to local churches, given his long history in not only leading a vineyard church, but raising up so many leaders and planters in vineyard churches, seeing some people uh, do really well and then other people really struggle. So there, there's a lot of wisdom in Steve, and, and I would encourage you to check out uh, my conversation with him. But just to speak to the question about like what's in it for me right now, I, mean, I have a top three. My, my first one would be clarity. Right? The work we're doing is going to enable clarity around what it is that we're bearing witness to in the vineyard and the manner in which we're doing it. Right? It's going to distill who we are in ways that allow us to speak with coherence about it. It also, that clarity allows us to welcome other churches. You guys would have heard from Seth Bazakas a couple of uh, afternoons ago. Pastor just adopted a wonderful church in, in the you know, heart of New York City. Uh, Seth and I have been friends for a couple of years as that's been happening. And one of the things he regularly said to me was, you know, I love the vineyard. I love being with you guys. It would be so helpful to me if there was something other than hanging out that could clarify for me what it is to be in the vineyard. Now, we never want to stop hanging out. I'm actually really into hanging out. But I think giving people more resources around that kind of clarity of identity will help us. My, my second top thing would just be like resourcing, 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 right? The way we've been thinking about this is this way. Everything we require, we must resource. Yeah. We cannot resource anything that we're not, or we cannot require anything we're not resourcing, right? We're not in the business of creating invisible lines like in the museum where you cross the laser and the thing squawks at you because you came too close to the painting, right? We, we are trying to create very, very clear narratives about who we are so that we can resource for those things. And one piece of really great news is that 90% of what we're talking about is actually just what it means to be a disciple, right? In the ordination process, there's probably 10% that's very, very specific to the work of, of a local church pastor. But the other 90% is just stuff you're going to want people in your churches to be, know, and do, right? And so all that resourcing is going to become part of what it means to be able to lead in the vineyard. So, so that'd be the second thing. And then the third thing would be that this work allows us to establish pastoral relationships in much clearer ways in areas and regions, right? Which means that pastors can have incremental help around the stuff on values, theology, and genetic code, as well as incremental help on anything else that happens to be coming up in ways that we've just never had before, right? In the past, if you sort of treat it like it first in the negative, in the past when we've had crises or problems, the only recourse that a church has had is relational. And if, it, if say, if a pastor's kind of going off the rails, one of the first things to go is relational connection, right? They're not going to want to have the conversation. And so we end up in a situation where it's like, well, does that church get to stay a vineyard or not? And in some cases, if a pastor needs some time out to grow or rest or whatever else, the church would be fine. They want to stay in the vineyard. They don't want to be kicked out just because their pastor's having a hard season, right? 
And so what we're developing is a framework in which there's incremental pastoral relationships that operate at the local area and regional level around a kind of clarity that we share about what we're actually trying to get done. So to me, it's really those three things, clarity, resourcing, and connection. Yeah. Can't wait for that. Maybe the most common question we've heard, the number one question is, (laughs) Caleb, I'm already an ordained vineyard pastor. So does this process mean that my ordination is going to be canceled? Do we have a grandfather clause? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, everyone's ordination is canceled. See? (laughs) No, 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 of course not. Of course not. I mean, you've heard me talk about this for a while now, so I think you could probably predict the way in which I and our team are thinking about this. Ordination is not a disembodied process. It's not a program that we're trying to impose from the outside on the thing that is. Vineyard pastors constitute the vineyard. (laughs) right? Our pastors and our churches make the vineyard. The thing that a vineyard pastor would be, know, and do is represented in this room. So our process is fundamentally sort of oriented in a posture, I would say, of gratefulness and of self-awareness that, frankly, we stand on the shoulders of so many who've come before us, right? The moment that we're in is not possible without five decades of people laying their lives down for the thing that God has been doing in the vineyard movement. Ken Gullickson, and Larry Myers, Joni Gullickson, right all the way through to the moment that we're in right now. There's so many. I've had occasion to talk to some of these folks. If you come to watch the Jesus Revolution movie, part of what you'll see is the story of some of those early people. Ken Gullickson, who was the founder of the first Vineyard Church, was literally at the baptisms that are pictured in the movie. He told me he baptized 50 people that day, right? We stand on the shoulders of not only giants of the faith, but frankly just kind, good, faithful people responding to the work that God's doing in the world. That's what it is. That it, to be a vineyard pastor is nothing less than that. So I think we need to be acutely aware of that. There's people in this room who've been in ministry, I'm sure, for 40 years, for 30 years, 20, 10, 5. Some of you guys have probably been vineyard pastors for six months, right? but we honor all of what it is that the Lord's been doing. If you're an ordained vineyard pastor today, you will be an ordained vineyard pastor in the future. Do you remember in in 1 Corinthians how Paul uh, speaks to the church? He calls them both the saved and the being saved. That ring a bell for anyone, right? He says, you are the saved, you're so wonderful. And then he says, for those of you who are being saved, dot, dot, dot. And it sort of begs the question, well, what are we? Are we the saved or are we the being saved? And Paul's answer to the church is, well, you're, you're both, right? You've been saved by Jesus and you're in the process of being saved. You're being called forward into your salvation, right? There's a similar thing going on with ordination, right? When we're doing ordination, we're naming what it is to be an ordained pastor. If you're an ordained pastor, it's already happened. You're an ordained vineyard pastor. But as we do the naming work, we're also saying, look, enter deeper into your calling. Participate in resourcing that allows you to grow into the thing that you say that you already are, right? Has anybody in this room ever needed to grow into a thing that they've already claimed as their own identity? Of course, right? That's Christian discipleship. There's a similar thing going on in relationship to ordination. You shouldn't wonder if you're qualified. What we're trying to do instead is say, look, you've been named by your community as an ordained vineyard pastor. From here on out, what we're doing is we're creating frameworks for equipping and resourcing and empowering and growth so that you can not only be ordained, (laughs) but be being the person who is an ordained vineyard pastor in your world. So our posture is basically grateful invitation to continue to become the thing that you already are, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you so much, Caleb. Thanks so much, Amanda. Awesome. All right, guys, we're, we're getting close to the end. I'm sure you'll be glad uh, to hear it, but I want to invite Rob Morgan to come back up to talk uh, briefly with me about the road ahead. Right? Many of you are nuts and bolts thinkers and you're thinking all this stuff is super great. Thanks for all of it. What's coming in the future? Right? So we're going to talk uh, about the far flag, what we take to be sort of the end of the process, and then I'll talk about some near flags. So as you think about a process like this and certainly the integrated reality of the national office, local churches, the various governing relationships that are existing within local churches, elder-led churches, board-led churches, pastor-led churches, 
we need to reverse engineer some things to figure out what's the timing and the pace to do the discerning work of this process and do it well and kindly. So we've put a far flag summer of 2025 to bring this process to the place in which things are solid and clear and you are invited to have gracious on-ramps to the inclusive reality of shared credentialing and ordination. Now that probably for some of you feels like that's an awfully long way away. Well, you know, two years moves pretty quickly. And if you reverse engineer that, there's other gatherings and spaces and meetings that need to happen in order for the right people to have the right view, voice, and vote in the process, which includes your local governing structures. What we're asking you to be present to is that there are going to be conversations that you need to have at the right pace in your local context to figure out how does this work in your space and how do you give a yes to the thing that is joining in this new relationship between pastors and churches and the vineyard movement and how does that all work and so we know that there's some timing that just has to be uh, slow enough and yet still fast enough what you should be expecting is in the next few months our pace will increase so that you can be served with the right information and details to then have the sort of conversations that allow you to come back to the table and say we are here we're part of the family and we understand how this is going to work in our local context and give a yes in the ways that would make sense to the process yeah great so that's the far flag we're looking at summer of 2025 i'll tell you about what's happening directly next here then here's the near flag so the next thing that we're doing together that's coming up out of this meeting would be our our regional conferences right and so there's going to be a whole string of regional conferences uh, in the fall of 2023. At those regional conferences, you'll hear from me or a member of our team about a few things. The first is you're going to hear about the results of some external research that we've done and are doing into uh, the way that other denominations and movements of churches have done this kind of work. So obviously, we're, we're in a position where we have a lot to learn and the great thing about being in the vineyard, I hope you experience this, I know that I do, is we have a lot of favor around the church. People tend to like the vineyard. And so that means we have active relationships right now around the questions of ordination with movements like the Evangelical Free Church and the Covenant Church and the ACNA Anglican Church or the Open Bible Fellowship, the Assemblies of God, Global Methodists. All these people have not only been willing to talk with us, but share all kinds of process stuff with us so that we can learn from the things that work well for them. And they're very frank, honestly, about the parts that are hard. And we're hoping that we can get the best of the wisdom from those movements and several others as well. So you'll hear an update from us about what we're learning in that research process and the way it's going to shape what we do. The second thing you'll hear is an update around our decision-making processes. One of the interesting realities of this moment is not only are we working on clarity of content, but we're working on clarity of process, right? Some of you guys will know that we have, say, a statement of faith, right? Our statement of faith was written by a couple of people and at some point, somewhere along the way, seemingly adopted by the vineyard. There was probably a moment where we said, hey, we have a statement of faith and everybody stood up and sang a worship song and it was great, right? <laughs> and now the statement of faith moves around in our world and some people think it's the greatest thing ever and some people think it's the worst thing ever and some people cross their fingers when they sign it because they've just planted a church and we require people to sign the statement of faith. I think there are a couple things that we would want to pay attention to here. Number one is that when people are crossing their fingers while signing a document, that's a problem, right? <laughs> and it might actually be a problem with the document. It may be a problem with them. It may be a problem with us. There are a number of things we need to think about there. But when people are crossing their fingers to sign a document because they love the vineyard, but they have an issue with something in the statement of faith, that's creating an environment in which we're saying not just... Um, feel free to sort of select and amend and it's okay because we love you. But we're also saying the content of our theological statements doesn't really matter that much. Just go ahead and sign. That doesn't feel like integrity to me. That feels problematic to me. And we have work to do around that. So then the question is, how would we do that work? Because a statement of faith is a really important document. If we're going to have one, we wouldn't want to take it lightly, yes? Yes. 
Therefore, we would need to develop clear processes so that we can pay attention to how we would work on an identity document like the Statement of Faith. The same would go for the Vineyard USA bylaws, as well as any conversations about bylaws where Vineyard USA is connecting to local churches in a bylaws framework. Many, many churches are asking us today, how can we be more connected in a kind of legal or operational way to Vineyard USA. We just haven't had a paradigm for that. And that's not the kind of thing that we want to put two guys in a room to just develop. (laughs) That's the kind of thing where we need to have an active process where it's possible for everybody who's got a stake in it to see clearly what's happening and to move towards it with confidence that that's that that process has been well run. So we'll have an update around our external research. We'll have an update around decision-making processes. And then finally, uh, well, throughout the fall, (laughs) you're going to be hearing from members of our national team, specifically the associate national directors. So that would be Christina, who we heard from last night, Josh, uh, Christina Lowry, Josh Williams, uh, Danielle Pathak. I think we've heard from all of them this week. Um, about all kinds of resourcing that they're developing in their particular lane. So, you know, Christina would be church health and development resources, or Danielle would be pastoral health and development, Josh is evangelism and justice resources. What I want you to hear clearly from me is that our team is mutually supporting. (laughs) We're thinking together in the categories of what should a vineyard pastor be, know, and do about all the resources that we're developing. So what that means is when you opt into an offering that one of them is bringing to you and saying maybe this would help your church or help you personally as a pastor or help you to do the things that you want to get done. All of what's being presented to you has been thought through in relationship to the ordination process and the resourcing that goes with it. So uh, when you see those resources, know that that's all kind of connected. And in fact, as we, as we wrap up, I want to return uh, to a resource that we're able to offer you uh, today. Did you, did you remember the Seminary Now video that we watched? Um, everybody at this conference is getting a, uh, an opportunity to have a free course on Seminary Now with Nijay Gupta, the guy we did the podcast with about cultivating biblical imagination. And it's on how to read the New Testament. So Seminary Now is here, they have a table, and they've partnered with us uh, to give us a free course for anybody who wants it uh, to study that. And then we've also negotiated a deal with them where uh, we get 40% off, anyone in the vineyard can get 40% off of an individual annual membership to Seminary Now. Uh, what that means is for essentially a hundred bucks, you can get access to all their courses. They have, they have many, many courses for around a year. During this year, uh, we are going to be running a number of beta frameworks. We love to test things before we roll them out and say, this is what we're doing on our team. It's one of our values is we want to make sure it works before we hand it to churches and say, try this. Um, we're going to be beta testing the use of seminary now for equipping around things like how to read the Bible, around basics of theology. They have Spanish language resources for theology and Bible stuff too. There's stuff around a journey to multi-ethnicity, around empowering women in leadership, around all sorts of things that we, we find especially helpful and accessible. They've got an app. You can you know watch it on the bus or some of you will probably watch it in the bathroom, which I would never do, but it's possible. Um, And uh, those are ways in which you can uh, either by yourself or perhaps in a community of people in your church develop a cohort for learning and developing leaders. We've also uh, got a deal where there's 30% off church site licenses. So I would really encourage you uh, to check out what Seminary Now is doing over the next 12 to 24 months. We'll be running betas. You'll hear more updates on how those are working. And if we like what we see, if it turns out to be helpful, we'll continue to work with them. So that's a resource of the sort that we're hoping to be continually providing to pastors and churches that'll help us to grow in the stuff we're talking about. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, Ruben, I'm going to have Ruben come and he's going to pray and we're going to be done. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Caleb. This is a historic moment uh, in the vineyard. I think if we have to work for two years, that would serve the next hundred years. It's, it's, it's not too much time. I want to share Psalm 127.1. One. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Lord, we pray today that you lead us in this process, that you build this house, this house of worship, this uh, temple that is the vineyard. We are your temple, Lord. And we want to ask you to lead us to build in us, in every local pastor, in every local church, as ministers of your word. Lead us, God. And thank you for the lead team and every person that is involved in this process. We pray for them. We pray for each person here. That you bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.